With its grainy visuals and garish 1970s aesthetic, Late Night with the Devil initially promises an immersive experience rooted in the conventions of a kitschy late-night talk show. Live from UBC Studios in New York City, it's Night Owls with Jack Delroy! The film, which debuted on Shudder this week after a successful theatrical run, purports to be the restored master tape of the last broadcast of a fictional talk show called Night Owls, with Jack Delroy. Desperate to keep his show on the air, Delroy, played by character actor David Dasmalchin in his first major lead role, resorts to a number of escalating stunts during a Halloween Sweeps Week episode. Longtime horror fans will no doubt be thinking of the BBC's similarly premised Ghostwatch from 1992. Both Late Night and Ghostwatch share a core similarity. They utilize the mockumentary format and the illusion of a live broadcast to deliver found footage horror experiences. Ghostwatch leverages the reputation of the network and the presence of well-known presenters to create a sense of legitimacy. This blurring of fiction and reality significantly amplifies its horror, as viewers were caught unaware as the supposed live broadcast took a terrifying turn. Late Night with the Devil, on the other hand, crafts authenticity through its meticulous attention to the aesthetic of 1970s late-night television. The production design, costumes, and intentionally cheesy vibe all contribute to a sense of watching a genuine artifact from the era. This period-specific approach adds a layer of nostalgic familiarity that enhances the uncanny feeling when the supernatural intrudes on the broadcast. We're gonna have to take a quick break, folks. When we come back, though, one of the old friends of our show, who are we? We're about to commune with some spoilers, so be warned. And what's your favorite found footage film? Let us know in the comments. The challenge of verisimilitude, the appearance of truth, is fundamental to found footage films. Since the genre hinges on presenting fictional events as authentic recordings, filmmakers have had to devise increasingly clever techniques to maintain the illusion. Early entries often relied on shaky camera work, grainy footage, and untrained actors. But the questions the director always has to answer are, how do I explain why the camera is here? And how do I tell my story with those constraints? And that's where the film runs into trouble, as Late Night with the Devil gets hamstrung by its own premise. So it just ignores the premise whenever it gets too inconvenient. For the first of what I hope will be many, many shows. Directors being stifled by the genre isn't surprising, nor is it really that uncommon. Paranormal Activity 4 runs into the same issue, forcing its heroine to carry a phone around with her in lieu of the camcorders and security footage of the first three films. Perhaps the most similar example to what happens in Late Night comes from the obscure pre-Blair Witch found footage mockumentary The Last Broadcast from 1998. 95% of that film is dedicated to a spooky low-budget true crime tale before the very end turns into a traditional feature to throw the audience for a loop. It's a twist that often leaves viewers puzzled and frustrated because the setup was so good. It feels like a cop-out to suddenly change storytelling mediums that way after over an hour of leading the audience down a path. And while there are no hard, fast rules about these things, and it doesn't ruin the movie for me, it's the filmmaking equivalent of finding shark repellent in your bat utility belt, just as the sharks are closing in. Late Night starts earnestly enough, with a short biography of your host, Jack Delroy. Jack was a Chicago radio man for WGN before getting a big break hosting a late-night talk show for fictional network UBC. A blink and you'll miss it insert lets us know that the previous host fell down an elevator shaft to his death. Delroy was affable and popular, but he never made it to Johnny Carson level. The film does a nice job of mixing real-life events and popular media with the fictional for that added kick. For example, All in the Family and the Rockford Files are still real, but UBC also has something called the Badge and the Gun that does well in the ratings. This kind of world building is where Late Night with the Devil is at its best. We're also told that Jack belongs to the Grove, one of those mysterious Freemason-like exclusive clubs where the rich and powerful gather to make deals and perhaps sacrifice virgins, if the rumors are true. The narrator also introduces us to Jack's wife Madeline, who was a beautiful, sought-after actress before they got married. Unfortunately, she developed lung cancer, despite not being a smoker, and wasted away in the public eye. Now anyone who has a cursory knowledge of the history of horror should get what's going on here if they piece together Jack's success, plus an eerie cult, plus his wife's sickness. It's just math, but it's nice to see that between Late Night and Immaculate, Rosemary's Baby's legacy is still going strong. Unable to get past Johnny, though, Jack resorted to more desperate Geraldo-style tactics by booking confrontational guests and appealing to the lowest common denominator. We are gonna take a break, and I'll, I'll be right back, and you will not. That brings us to the final broadcast, which this film claims to be. Actually, the film claims to be a restored master of the original broadcast, plus never-before-seen behind-the-scenes footage. All this means is that when the show goes to break, the footage turns black and white and follows Jack backstage for private conversations. We're never actually told why someone is following them around backstage to catch some candid moments, but no one ever seems to notice the backstage camera either. I kept waiting for Das Malchin to gym the camera or chase the cameraman away, but it doesn't happen. 
It's just never acknowledged. This gives the filmmakers an easy way to drop some exposition on us, or advance the story by simply telling us something is happening. But it also feels like they couldn't find a way to tell the story with the premise and aesthetic they wanted to. So they added this. They should have cut the whole show right after Christo died. Bombed, you mean? No. Didn't you hear? He's dead. Things start to go awry when resident charlatan Christu has a real-life overpowering connection with the dead. It's written off by everyone as part of the show, especially the arrogant skeptic Carmichael Haig, played with smarmy excellence by the Matrix trilogy's Ian Bliss. Haig is something of a highlight of the film for me. Clearly he's based on the amazing Randy, a magician and escape artist who became a celebrity skeptic with heavy emphasis on the celebrity. Like Randy, Haig is more concerned with bullying guests and demonstrating his superior intellect than he is with real scientific research. Haig also provides the through line of the episode, as he has a half million dollar challenge for anyone who can prove the supernatural is real. When Christo's Icor spouting death rattle doesn't satisfy, Jack brings out parapsychologist Dr. June Ross Mitchell and her patient Lily. Lily would be the other standout of the cast, played with vacant creepiness by Ingrid Torelli. Her awkward stares into the camera would be just that in real life. She's nervous on television after all, but in the context of a hey there's something definitely wrong with this kid movie, her wide-eyed glee is unsettling. Lily is the survivor of a cult that worshipped Abraxas, who is one of those deities that has leaked into multiple cultures and occupies several roles. Sometimes he's a god, sometimes he's a demigod, sometimes he's a demon. Here, he's a stand-in for the devil. The Abraxas worshippers set fire to their compound, and only Lily survived. But wouldn't you know it? The one way Abraxas can enter you is if you witness a sacrifice in his name. So Lily has been possessed. Or so Dr. June says. Haig, of course, is still skeptical. It so happens I have a PhD in the subject. From the University of Hogwash, if I'm not mistaken. A combination of ratings pressure from the network, Haig's annoying skepticism, and lust for that top spot lead Jack to push June into bringing out Abraxas on live television. You know who I am, Doctor. Both Jack and June get more than they bargained for, as Lily slash Abraxas reveals the affair they've been having. And we also learn that Abraxas is the deity that the Grove has been making sacrifices to. Good to see you again, Jack. This is a great scene, with Torelli doing her best Linda Blair impression, all contorted and vile. And then, it's all downhill from there, thanks largely to the filmmakers abandoning the premise so that they can get the ending they wanted. Haig accuses Dr. June of putting the audience under mass hypnosis, to convince them they just saw a demonic possession. To demonstrate, he does the same to Jack's sidekick, Gus, convincing Gus that worms are crawling around under his skin. And we get the lovely sight of Gus pulling his own stomach apart to let the worms come spilling out. When they roll back the footage, though, it's all just a series of suggestions from Haig, who had hypnotized the entire audience. Except Lily. Why is Gus acting so silly? It's right around here where the film stops working for me. The mass hypnosis trick only works to give us a good gross-out shot. It doesn't add anything to the story that wouldn't also be added through Gus crawling around like a goof, which we see later on anyway. Plus, it calls into question which things are being captured on film and which are part of our collective hallucination. Jack asks the producers to roll back the footage and sees an image of his dead wife standing behind him. This triggers all hell breaking loose with Abraxas, splitting Lily's head open and killing most of the people on stage. And from there, the film completely forgets the found footage premise and travels with Jack into a hallucination slash memory in which he kills his wife to end her pain. Only when he wakes up, he's standing over Lily's dead body. In fact, Madeline has been here the whole time. 30 seconds, people! Hey. Nothing's been fixed since Hey, great show so far. I don't believe we've been acquainted. Don't be a fool. We go way back. Didn't you hear? He's dead. Puked his guts out on the way to Sinai. Late Night with the Devil will scratch the itch for a lot of horror fans who enjoy that nostalgic feeling of the 1970s, even if they were born decades later. Its aesthetic is spot on, even though the interstitials were controversially AI generated. Apparently none of the 10 production companies from the pre-credits had a graphic artist on staff. In the end, my quibble with the storytelling devices is minor and probably irrelevant. The people have already spoken on this one. But it does make me more appreciate the filmmakers who stick to their guns on a film's premise and find creative ways out around these narrative sand traps. Stay warm, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time.